we've been through so much and like she's with me all the time you know if, like i have like this weird fantasy of like of like some girl who's like it's me or your dog i'd be like yeah, like savannah every day of the week get out of here <laughs> This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we talk to athletes, adventurers, and business owners from around the world of adventure sports. Whether you're climbing Mount Everest, starting a bike shop, or getting up off your couch to take your kids hiking for the first time, we want you to have the motivation and inspiration you need to chase that next adventure. The Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by Camp Crate, the leaders in fully planned self-guided backpacking adventures, as well as backpacking gear rental. You can check them out at campcrate.net. So imagine wanting to get out of college, pay off some loans, and planning to literally walk around the world for the next five years. That's exactly what Tom Tursich did when... He set out from his home in New Jersey to walk all the way down to Argentina and then some of Africa, across Europe, across Asia, Australia, and then back to his home in New Jersey. Tom is not done with that experience, but we interviewed him two years ago and we replayed that episode yesterday. And today we have the update of where he is, what the last two years of his life have been like. He's a great guest. Super insightful, fantastic photographer. Highly recommend following him on Instagram because it's really interesting stuff. Humble guy. I could have talked to him for days. You can probably pick it up in this episode. It, it, it's a little longer than usual. It just, you know, sometimes you just connect. He had some time. Not all the guests always have a lot of time. So uh, this is a kind of a long episode, but man, there's some good, good nuggets of wisdom, good advice. And what he's doing is just, I love how pure it is. I mentioned that a couple times in the episode. It just, adventure does not have to be complicated. It does not have to be extreme. It does not have to be overly expensive. It just has to be wild. It has to be, in a lot of ways, it has to be simple. Not easy, but simple. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm not going to spend too much time talking, but let's talk about our sponsors and let's get into it. First sponsor, who is also helping us make adventure happen for you, is Athletic Brewing. And they're doing that by funding our adventure grant, which is $1,000 that we're giving away to someone doing an adventure in 2019. $1,000 might not sound like much, but my first few adventures only cost yeah, less than 1000 bucks a piece. And they were so impactful to who I am today that I think it's a tragedy that more scholarships and funds and grants don't exist for young people or old people or middle-aged people to do something like this versus paying for another overly priced semester in college. Because my truest, my most valuable education, if I really think about it, probably came from my adventures. College was incredibly important, and I'm so glad I went. But adventure was just something just can't be taught in a book. You know, some things you just have to learn and you learn a lot about life out there. Okay. I'm going on a rant. I just realized, let me get back on track. I was talking about non-alcoholic craft beer, athletic brewing, (laughs) but they are funding the grant. So if you know somebody doing an adventure this year, apply because we want, we want more of these. We want more people to have the ability to go on adventures and we know life is hard and you know, life gets complicated the older you get. So every little bit helps. We also have the Nomadic. They are an outdoor subscription box that gets shipped to your door. You're familiar with subscription boxes. They are for outdoor gear chosen by outdoor enthusiasts. We are giving away three subscription boxes to three different listeners. Apply. And the link in the show notes, um, it's at the nomadic.com, I believe, slash Adventure Sports Podcast, but check the show notes just to be sure. And also CS Instant Coffee. They are the makers of single-serve Arabica 100% compostable packaging coffee. So you can take these little single serves with you out camping, hunting, and have an excellent cup of coffee in the middle of the woods. If you've ever been on an adventure, you know how 
just you cherish those little things like a hot meal you don't care if it's a hot can of tuna if it's hot after a cold wet day you are it is the best thing you've ever had in your life and to have a pretty freaking good cup of coffee after a cold wet day in a tree stand or on a boat or hiking out in the woods man there's nothing better i'll tell you what so uh give them a shot there's also a, a discount in our show notes with that as well All right, let's get into this. Oh, man. So so you were on the show close to two years ago now with with your first two years of your trip, and you had just finished or, or were almost done with South America. And I think you were you you were back home for just a little while. Yep. Man, it, it was just crazy because I, I was looking for a show to replay and I'm like, oh, I remember this was one of the first episodes of this show I'd ever listened to. And I was just a listener then. You were hosted by Kurt um, the last time. And I, lis- I listened to that episode uh, a few days ago and man, he did a great job interviewing. So I'm, I'm going to try to do as good of a job as him. I was listening. I'm like, this is a perfect interview. This is almost two years later. Can you just kind of briefly tell us what the last two years have been like as far as where you've gone and has it gone to plan what you originally thought the plan would be? Yeah, so the last two years uh, have been crazy, uh, out of plan. Uh, So I finished walking South America. I I ended in Montevideo, Uruguay, where I have cousins. And I left Savannah there with my cousins. And then I took a flight down to, uh, Tierra del Fuego and took a boat to Antarctica for like 12 days, just set my feet on it. And, uh, and then came back, got Savannah. And then we flew back to New Jersey to get her, uh, paperwork to get into Europe. It'll take uh, about a month to do Savannah's paperwork to get into Europe. And so we had that planned all along. We'd go back. And when I got back to New Jersey, I started having like these little stomach aches and I didn't think anything of it at the time because it was so, so minor uh, that I was just like, oh, you know, I was like, I must be eating something wrong or maybe it's, you know, just adjusting to uh, the different food back home versus what I was eating in South America. And uh, so while I was waiting for Savannah's paperwork, I flew to Iceland to walk across Iceland and my stomach was getting worse and I was starting to have these kind of these cramps that would kind of like uh shut me down for a couple minutes where i'd just be my stomach would be so tight that i couldn't really do anything and i ended up not being able to finish iceland because uh the there was it was unexpectedly warm and there's some glacier runoff uh so there's these rivers that weren't supposed to be there yet and it all went it all fell apart ended up just touring around iceland so i get back home get savannah's paperwork we head over to Ireland. And when I get to Ireland, I'm with family in, where is it? In, in Galway uh, on the West Coast. And and my stomach's even worse. And now I'm searching for for medicine and stuff like that. I'm thinking, man, this is irritable bowel or something like that. And by this point, I saw two doctors at home and I'd seen another doctor, you know, in, in Galway. I get to Dublin uh, with more family, see a doctor there. And still pushing through, I'm getting these pains now are so bad that it's causing me to basically have to just be writhing on the ground in 10 out of 10 agony for, you know, for five minutes at a time. Maybe not five minutes. It felt like forever, but just insanely poignant pain in my stomach. And and I was try, I was cutting out all these different foods. I was trying to cut out everything, thinking maybe you, I, I developed some intolerance to something. I'm trying all these different medicines. Nothing's working. Basically, I get to Scotland. And so I take a ferry from North Ireland into Scotland. And that first day off the ferry, I walk like three miles. And it was only four miles walk to the ferry. I walk three miles. I come to this field. And I'm sitting in this field. And I'm thinking like, it's it's one o'clock in the afternoon or something. I'm like, I can't go anymore. Like, I'm done. And I had never up to that point in two years of walking walked less than say 15 miles even on my worst day i'd push out 50 miles and this i'd walk seven miles and i was so exhausted and so i realized like something at that point i really like had to kind of come to terms with uh, i can't just push through this like i had pushed through everything else 
And so long story short, I go to London hospital for a month. They can't figure out what it is. Fly home. It takes them two months to figure out what it is. Basically, it's just bacterial illness. I lost, uh, I don't know, 50 pounds. <laughs> and, Holy uh, cow. Was in was in just absolute agony for for three months, just losing weight, just in pain all the time. So uh, that put me off course for a year, and it was uh, it was uh, pretty dark times, and you know just not any joy in anything. You know, I was just subsisting, trying to get down food. Eventually, started getting better about Christmas time. Put it weight back on, going to the gym, started working to. Uh, to re restock some funds. And then as soon as I thought I was ready, I, I, uh, took a flight to Copenhagen and, uh, started walking again. And that's the second year. And since then the good times, and I walked from Copenhagen down to Gibraltar, Spain, and then across, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and, and now in Italy. So finally back on a roll, but the, the past two years, did not go to plan at all. And, uh, they were, they're pretty rough, but really glad to be back out here. And, and Europe was a good, a really good place to kind of get my health back and get my legs back under me and, uh, get my, get the, the mental game back in order. Why was, why was Europe good for that compared to maybe some of the other places you've already been through? Well, Central and South America, first off, I was so green to i had walked four months when i first uh, walked from philadelphia down to texas i was four months but i had never walked through like entering mexico was such a a head rush just all the different factors all the different you know moto taxis and so much uh to get my head around i didn't speak the language and then you know going through el salvador which when i went through el salvador was the most dangerous country in the world and then going through deserts of Peru and Chile for months and months at a time. I was in such peak physical, mental. I was so freaking sharp. I was so honed in on everything in such a good rhythm. And it was really challenging terrain and uh, just country to walk through that I had to be in peak form. And then to get to Europe where I can, from Copenhagen, basically down to Spain, I followed like a beautiful developed bike path that would pass through a town every five miles, something like that. So I never had to worry about water, never had to worry about food. The temperature was not bad. People spoke English. So going through that, uh, was definitely level. It was easy. It was, it was on easy mode going through Europe. Oh man. I, you know, I'm sure that was, it's funny how things work out like that. If you would have tried to approach, cause I just listened, I just listened to the episode. Like I said, Man, you had some hard times in Central and South America, and if you would have not been on your A game, man, it, it might have not might have discouraged you enough to not continue the trip entirely. I don't know. Yeah, I never would have been. I would have pushed through. I mean, even if I was robbed or stabbed or something, I would have continued no matter what. Uh, but it could have definitely been if I wasn't on my A game. You know, there could have been worse outcomes. You know, I could have been. I could have been robbed. I. A guy tried to rob me in Panama City. Didn't you know? I, I was able to in Florida. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a couple spots in the U.S. that are as sketchy as anywhere I've ever been. <laughs> I think Panama City might be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, I mean, there's there's you know some places in Central and South America, um, especially just being at the time I was so new to it. I didn't, it was such a different culture and I didn't know quite how to handle myself in these new places that it was, it was a lot to take in. And now going through Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia, I had kind of have all that stuff embedded in me. I, I, when I see there's, there's a certain, when you first start traveling to second world and third world countries, and especially when you get off of the tourist paths and you're in places, you're on streets that are maybe dusty with concrete that aren't paved. And, you know, you see the houses that they build, that people build one story at a time just because there aren't loans or they're not making enough to get loans. So, you know, they build a story and then there's they leave rebar on the second floor to when they get money, build a second story. And when you're first starting off, you don't know these things. You, you haven't talked to people. You're just not as worldly. And coming from 
you know, New Jersey, which is a very affluent state and there's schools, you know, it's very densely populated. There's schools in every township and it's just so it's like a utopia essentially. And then going down to the second and third world countries at first, it's very overwhelming. And you think, Oh my God, like this is the worst neighborhood I've ever been in. It's terrible. But after a while, you learn to change your gauge and you re- you know, at least I know that people are good and society wouldn't work if people weren't, if the majority of people weren't good. And so even going through these towns and trusting people, it's still jarring just the different level of wealth. And it once you get that adjustment and you then I have a better sense of, is this really a bad area or is it just slightly poorer or slightly less developed than I'm used to? And to have that honed in helps a lot. And so going through like Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, which were rougher, obviously, than say Denmark or France or Germany. And I'm walking through these neighborhoods that would be very rough you would imagine in germany let's say or france Uh, but for you know algeria or morocco wherever or for panama el salvador peru you go okay this is like this is just a fine normal town this is how life is here kind of thing and so to get that gauge uh that helps a lot and uh, I forget what the question is. I went on a, on a tangent, but yeah. yeah I don't remember um, either. <laughs> I'm just listening, man. This is awesome. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, back in Italy right now, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's even like Algeria is a very, very safe country and Morocco, very, very safe country. So I went through the worst of it. As you're saying, the, the first two years, something could have discouraged me. Central America, El Salvador, Mexico, El Salvador, and um, Honduras, and then Colombia, I think all those are in the top 15. Yeah, El Salvador and Honduras are one, two, the most dangerous countries in the world. And then Colombia and Mexico are up there as well. And so I went through the worst of it for sure. And I got through fine. And now, you know, Algeria is statistically is safer than uh, the USA, it's just more of a culture shock. So yeah, to get through that, uh, to get through the Americas and come out and, and then have this kind of health scare and be able be fortunate to be continuing in Europe where I know the culture better, it's safe, it's developed, there's supermarkets and bike paths. Uh, the timing worked out really well for me to have that setback and then to be able to get my feet back under me and have the experience of the Americas. Uh, so when I wasn't in the best health, uh, I still have, you know, all that experience to judge places accurately. So, so do you know what was going on with your stomach now? Do you have a clearer picture? No, they're not. The doctors never really figured out. They're just throwing antibiotics at it until something hit. And really? it was, that is it, so crazy. Yeah. It, I spent, I spent a month, back and forth at uh, the London, the Royal London Hospital, no, the Royal Hospital of London in infectious disease. And they tested everything, couldn't figure out what it was. And so they don't know. I mean, something that they finally an antibiotic started working, but it could have been from the water, could have been from a handshake. It could have been from the food. You know, it was just one virulent bug just got me and just slowly, slowly, slowly grew. And, you know, it could have been from anything. They don't know. Yeah. Just kind of a free thing. How, how, how much time did that put you behind your schedule? Yeah, that was about seven months, really. Right. Yeah. Like eight months about. Yeah. I, you mentioned a little bit about it, but what, what was your mindset with that? Because I don't know, it, it I just feel like this is common for people on adventures. We talk to them, things don't go to plan all the time. And if someone told you before you started the trip, Hey, you're going to be sick for seven months. You don't know (laughs) that yet, but it's going to (laughs) suck. Like it, I don't know. I feel like it caused a lot of people hesitation if they knew just how hard something would be. What was your mindset with all that? Did you feel like you were getting behind or you're just like, we're going to get through this and continue? Yeah. I think my primary feeling was just frustration. I mean, mm-hmm. I was in such, it was really so agonizing. I mean, I was sleeping like two hours a night just because the, 
I was up all the time because of the pain. And it was just, you know, it was just, everything was sort of gray and I wasn't depressed or anything. And I wasn't discouraged. I was going to get back to walking when I got healthy. And it was more just, yeah, frustration. I was like, I want to get back to it. I want to, I want to get going. I want to get my health under me, but I was biding my time. And, you know, if honestly, there was parts of me where it's like, I'm, you know, I was pretty close. I was down to 130 pounds, I think. And I'm normally like 175. And I started looking at myself and I was like, you know, probably another month of this. I don't know, maybe another two months of them figure it out. You know, who knows? Probably because I'm not holding down any food. My weight's just dripping. I know I was probably gone in a couple months, I would imagine. But, you know, I would have been like one of those guys that they, you know, you read about, I don't know, the uh, like the the early explorers looking for a path through the the pan for the Panama Canal and 200 people go in looking for a path and like 12, 12 come back. Like I was for sure one of the 188 that was dead if it wasn't for modern medicine. But it was uh I if I died whatever, you know, it's that's it's part of life and I'm glad to be what it, what helped was hey I had walked I had done I had done what I wanted to do I this is something walking around the world is something I wanted to do since I was seventeen and I had walked the Americas and I was the eighth person to ever walk the Americas and it's epic and I had lived it and if I had gone you know hey I I did what I wanted to do that's all I could ask for so I'm glad to be on the other side and uh, it was you know it was an experience and. Is what it is, man. It's part of life. You get sick sometimes. It's not what you planned for, but it is your lot. It is what life kind of consists of is totally unexpected things like that. Did you have family or friends pressuring you to do one thing over another? Because that's pretty serious, uh, you know, if, if, if you didn't think you were going to make it at times. Yeah, no, I mean, they they were, I was stayed at my parents and, you know, I wouldn't have been able to get better with that my parents or my cousin in london who put me up and was there you know just taking care of me essentially but they never discouraged me and it's kind of funny i never even thought about that because they never even said anything about oh you're going to get back to it it was always just assumed that yeah i was going to uh so sure. yeah very 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 supportive family and wow. they knew you know the walk is just just part of who i am and it is who i am was there any unexpected benefit from being sick that long? Did did it make anything at all easier for you? Oddly, I don't think so. <laughs> um, so, so it was just hell on earth then. <laughs> yeah, honestly, like I, I look back and like try and I'm very good at either just like erasing memories. You know, I'm I'm pretty forgetful in general. Where it's oh that happened, I don't even remember that happening. Whatever or uh pulling the positive out of things but i don't know man because even when i got better it was months of walking before i physically felt better and i already had such a uh, a positive feel for life and i already i don't know just i i don't <laughs> it was just very dark times man it was dark times i'm glad to be out of it <laughs> Man, that is just so crazy. So you're you're you know you're back home. Oh, you know what? Actually, oh, go ahead. Sorry, so there was one thing. Actually, there was one good thing that got out of it. I was able to watch the entire uh, Eagles uh, Super Bowl run, and I was I was home for the Super Bowl run, which was amazing. So there was one good thing. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. It made, it made it all worth it. <laughs> the Eagles yeah, yeah. won the Super Bowl. Oh, that's yeah. funny coming from a guy who's walking around the world. Super Bowl yeah. <laughs> is still a big deal. That's that's too funny, man. So, yeah. golly, so so when were you able to get back on the road? You said you might have mentioned it before, but yeah. So I got back. Uh, so I guess I started. I stopped in uh, August of. I guess would that be seventeen? I guess it stopped in August of seventeen, and then it wasn't until mid March of 18 that i was able to start up again so i flew to copenhagen a friend in copenhagen so i got my got everything set there and then started walk down through copenhagen germany belgium france down to spain and going through like i was saying 
especially in Denmark and Germany, Belgium and France, like those Northern European countries are just so well freaking put together and have such a strong infrastructure for walking and for uh, cycling that it's one of the reasons I went instead, instead of picking up where I stopped in Scotland, which didn't have the infrastructure for cycling. And I was, either walk like pushing random through random fields in the country or walking on these narrow roads where cars were zipping around. I decided to pick back up in, in Denmark because it has one of the best cycling infrastructures in the world. And I knew I could just walk this path and not think and, and rebuild my strength. And so walking through Denmark and Germany, Belgium and France was phenomenal way to get my feet back under me. And just such beautiful countries. I was there right at the end of winter. So I had a little bit of snow in Denmark and Germany, and then it started getting warmer. And I, I walked through in spring and then down in Spain, walked some of the uh, uh, the French way, the Camino, and then walked some of the Via de la Plata down the, uh, down the center of Spain, down to Gibraltar. And just just really, really, really pleasant walking all the way. Um, you know, didn't have to worry about much. It was nothing like walking through the deserts of Peru and Chile. And one of the things I realized as well is beyond the physical aspect, it took me a couple months just physically to be able to walk, say, 24 miles a day. But I didn't realize until probably midway through Spain that just mentally, I had this sort of fog, this black cloud that was hanging over me from the illness. I I'd become pessimistic. I didn't realize it, but I'd become pretty um, uh, sour and pessimistic. And my thoughts just normally they just twist a little bit towards the the positive side of everything, and they were twisting towards the negative on everything. Just my comments were a little more biting, and I wasn't as pleasant. And it wasn't until for about four months of walking that I sort of realized that and was able to resolve that. And, uh, so it wasn't until mid Spain, I would say that I was totally had completely pushed the illness behind me physically and mentally. And it was just in time to, to walk through Morocco and then, and then Algeria and Tunisia, which were tougher countries, um, more mountainous, less developed and just culturally just totally freaking mind-blowing culturally so 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 different than the northeast of the u.s that just it was like going back into mexico for the first time athletic brewing is pioneering non-alcoholic craft beer yeah i said non-alcoholic craft beer and there's a number of reasons you might want to do that whether you're training for an event which a lot of our listeners are or, you know, if, you, if you're babysitting and don't want to be drunk in case something happens, I mean, stuff happens, but you still want to sit down and enjoy the game and have a beer, this is an incredible option for a full-flavored, full-bodied beer. Each can is only 50 to 70 calories. With IPA, golden ale, stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings, Athletic Brewing is a great option if you want that craft brewery taste. Uh, but not deal with the effects of alcohol itself. Uh, if you'd like to save 15% on your first order, go to athleticbrewing.com and use the code ADVENTURE at checkout. So, so what did you do specifically to turn turn your attitude towards the positive? Because that's, that's an interesting observation. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just just the act of walking. I think time in general would have resolved it maybe if I if I had been in Philadelphia and working a normal job. I think time would have resolved it, but it would have taken a longer period. But walking, when you're walking, the best analogy I have for walking is sort of your mind, you have this big garden outside of your house, which is your mind, and when you're living your day-to-day -day life, you don't realize it, but there's all these weeds popping up. And when you're walking, you're just weeding. And this it's it's something that is happening slowly and you, it's not consciously happening, but you're looking at a memory and you look at this memory and then three days later, you look at it again and you pick it up and you, know, you turn it over and you look at it and then you put it down and then another memory and an idea comes up and, and you're just going through your garden and 
and pulling out these weeds. And then one day you look around and you go, oh, it's a clean garden. And it's just the, the act of walking kind of enables this, this self-reflection and looking back on your memories and, and turning over your thoughts and reassessing yourself and how you view the world. And so it was, it was just the walking. It was the walking that enabled it and or at least uh, it helped it, it moved it along a little quicker. And, you know, walking is a very self-reflective act. And, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to basically do it professionally. And, and so I'm afforded a lot of time to look inward and, and kind of resolve any, any darkness that I have and, and turn it to something good. It's a beautiful thing. I'm, I I love the simplicity of what you're doing. There is nothing, seemingly nothing complex about it. It's no, it's it's a cart, like a like a baby cart almost. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, it is, it is a baby carriage. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> did people ever think there's a baby in there? Yeah, in Europe, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. And they're like, no, just a bunch of dirty gear. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, they like there's like a little bit transparent part, and you see people like expectantly you're looking for a baby, and then they kind of furrow their brow and look up at me. Like, eh, yep, <laughs> sorry, that is too funny, man. So, yeah, I know you mentioned uh, one of the most beautiful. You shared a story in the first episode two years ago where you talked about one of your favorite experiences was laying a tarp out in the deserts of Chile, and that was honestly just one of your favorite things because there was no light pollution um it was just the temperature was just right no bugs and you were just out there in the open looking at the milky way have you had a chance to do that much in europe and through uh northern africa not so much i mean i i have been able to tarp camp here and there in and in italy even surprisingly you see a lot of stars definitely much more than in the northeast i see a lot of stars pretty much every night and but in algeria and tunisia i had a police escort i had a police escort with me from the moment pretty much i got off the boat uh in algeria i had a police escort with me and they followed me 24 7 and so i wasn't allowed they wouldn't allow me to camp so i had to get to a hotel every night and so there was no stars unless I walked outside and looked up, but I was in a town every night or I was in a city. And so I haven't had that. It was the, the Peru and Chilean walking were just so simplistic and just perfect, just great reflective walking. And at night it would start to get dark and I never had to worry about where I was going to sleep because it was all desert. And I would just turn off the road, walk into the desert, throw out the tarp, it would be dark and then I would just be gone to the world. You know, I was a little, I was totally in the dark to everyone and all the stars would appear overhead. Uh, I imagine I'll probably, it'll probably be maybe Kazakhstan or Mongolia. When I get, when I get up there, I'll probably have something similar, but I think for the foreseeable future, it's uh, not a lot of stargazing. Not, not to that extent at least. Well, that's uh, I mean, do you still enjoy it just as much? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's one section of it. You know, I, I've camped in the jungle. I've camped in cemeteries. I've camped in, on mountains. I've camped, you know, in all, in all the conditions in the snow and, you know, it's all, it's all different. It's all, it all has its uh, characteristics, but that was, that was some prime, prime sleeping for sure. Can I, can I ask you, how does one coordinate a police escort across a country? What do you, what do you do? What do you gotta, how did that work? Uh, I didn't want, I, I didn't coordinate it. I didn't want it. Um, <laughs> oh. They, uh, I, Algeria is a difficult country to get into. They don't promote the tourism. Uh, maybe some French, it was, it was a French colony up until I guess 50 years ago now. So it was a French colony. And since then it's been closed off. So some French nationals go over there. They speak French. But other than that, there is very, very little tourism. They're pretty uh, ice, uh, insulated from most of uh, some of the terrorism, terrorism that affects other Muslim countries, and they take their security really seriously. And so I got off the boat. They found out I was an American, 
and basically brought me to the police station and they said, okay, like, okay, you're going to this hotel. Yes. Da da da. Like, okay, we're going to be at the hotel. And whenever you want to leave, we're, we'll come with you. And I was like, okay, I'm, you know, my plan is to walk across the country. And so <laughs> at every township, basically they would, the, my police escort would change. So probably like four or five times a day, the local escort would change. And, you know, I spent 40 days, you know, the first like two weeks, it was nice. I liked it the first two weeks or so because hey, I, I have guys to get lunch with. I can talk to with these guys. I can practice my French a little bit. I can make jokes with these guys. They give me some tips. And, you know, I wasn't tiring of paying for a hotel every night by then. But then after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks went on, it was, and they were there all the time. And not every police corps. Some of the police escorts, most of the police escorts were very professional and would kind of just let me go and do my thing if I, and they would kind of trail me in their car. If I waved them saying I, I needed something, I wanted to ask them a question, they would come out, help me. But every once in a while, I'd get these police escorts where I was really a novelty to them. You know, I'm an American, maybe the only American they've ever seen. And some of these guys, you know, like, I, you know, I got to, I got to shoot my shot. There's American. He's like, Hey, get me a visa kind of thing. Or they're pestering me or they're asking me all these questions. They can sell. I'm exhausted. You know, mind you, most of these days I'm walking much more than I normally would because they're requiring me to get to hotel every night. So there was by the last week I was in Algeria, I walked, the days were 10 hour, 10 hours of sunlight. And I walked from sun up to sundown five out of the seven days. So 30, plus miles every day to get to a hotel and i would i would you know sit down for a minute and some of these days i have this guy come up and, oh selfie let's take a selfie i'm like dude i'm so tired i just walk four hours straight i just want to like close my <laughs> eyes and uh uh but for the most part most of the escorts were really pleasant but it was just the it was just having people with you all the time I found myself not taking photos and stuff because I was thinking, all right, I'm going to inconvenience the police with this. I'm going to, you know, they're going to have to stop and get out and, you know, whatever. And, and then getting a hotel every night also really affected my rhythm where when I'm camping after a couple of days of camping, it really feels like I'm a part of the country and I'm just one day is kind of flown into the next, but the hotel getting a hotel makes this like sharp delineation in each day where each day feels separate from the next. And it just feels like, okay, I just got to get the next hotel. And it feels more, the walking is more of a chore than like part of this long kind of, of adventure. It just feels like, okay, this is my mode of travel rather than it being this progressive adventure. And so it definitely, that was an experience for sure. I, that was, that was, it ended up being really tough on me mentally having people with me all the time because I'm used to the exact opposite of that. But it's an interesting experience. It'll be an interesting chap chapter in the book. And yeah, it was, it was something. So you can, well, you can say, you know what that's like now. And I think that's what this whole experience is kind of about yeah. is experiencing just tons of things you never thought you would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's just another, yeah, exactly. Another chapter in the book, another experience. Yeah. It's, and that's so great to hear you say about hotels. I'm a big proponent of camping when you go on vacation or when you go visit somewhere, doing it in a unique way and not staying in hotels. And it's funny to hear you say that with, with your trip too. It did take some sort of element away from the experience. Yeah. You know, I know I, I looked through your pictures and scrolled through your Instagram and, and I remember you mentioned on photography was something you really look forward to and something you've enjoyed developing. Is is that yeah. still the case for you? Yeah, certainly. You've I, definitely gotten you know, better. I, I can tell from the first few years of the trip. It's like it's amazing to watch your progress. Yeah, it's what's really interesting about photography and what is great about the walk for the photography is that normally say on Instagram in particular, you want to be an Instagrammer or photographer. It's okay. You go to, I don't know, you go to Fiji, you get some palm trees in the beach or you go to Mount Fuji or you go to the Pacific Northwest and you go and you can wait for the perfect light and you can set up in this great location 
and, you know, take your photo and hey, look, you have this great photo and then slap a filter on it and bam, you're good to go. You do that long enough, you have thousands of followers. You know, you go to the same place and you develop your style, that's fine. But I remember in, for me, I remember being in Honduras and it was such a beautiful freaking country. It was so beautiful, but I didn't have the ability to capture it. I didn't have that skill. And so for me, I never, I was never interested in photography before this. It came out of the want to somehow like remember and capture and display these places, these unique places and the beauty of each place. And so photography was the best means to do that. But what's challenging is that I'm passing through different places and it's not, I'm not in perfect conditions. And that's what's, that's, what's fun about it for me is that, okay, this, in this place, you know, there's olive groves or in this place there's desert or in this place I'm in the mountains. And I like the challenge of, okay, how is the best way to convey this place in a photo? And so for Italy, you know, for example, I was just in uh, a town, Paola, and I, I had this uh, uh, Airbnb above the square, above the piazza. And I took this photo, put it in black and white. And it's like, that is like something I just wouldn't, two years ago, I just would not have been able to like, how do I capture this place? It's not on Instagram. It's black and white. It's not going to get a lot of likes, but it's just perfect. Like that is what this place looks like. And that's what I, that's what I'm always striving for is just the ability to, to distill a place into, into a photograph. And it's, it's really fun because it's immediate. I take photos during the day. I edit them into my tent at night and, you know, did I succeed? Did I not succeed? And so it's, it's, uh, it's a fun mental game for me. You know, it's something to think about while I'm on the road and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a perfect, I think it's a perfect hobby or perfect, uh, a little challenge while, while traveling. I feel the same way. I, I do a lot of bike touring and same feeling. It's you, you kind of wish you were somewhere like, man, it'd be cool as you're, you're walking and you're probably looking around thinking like, this would be a great shot at sunset, but that's five hours from now. I'm not just going to sit here. There's going to yeah. be enough. You're, you're, man, you're, you're so many variables all crisscrossing with a trip like this, that there's going to be probably hundreds, if not thousands of opportunities every day that are just an amazing shot that the person in normal life isn't going to have. And so your ability to practice your skill is, is just like, I mean, unlike anything I've ever seen, it's it's more than in, any photography school could do. You're you're in it all day long with that eye, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... sharpening and honing it all, man. What a what a cool thing to be able to scroll back through years from now and see everything you've done. Yeah, that's that's definitely um, one of the uh, something that I want to be able to do. I, you know, I want to have. I, that's what I want to just be able to be look back at my photos when this is done and be satisfied with the photos I took for, for myself. They are, right, I'm glad I took it in, in this style and this, you know, composition, whatever, you know, I'm trying to take them as much for other people as, as for myself. I, I want to be able to look back and be like, Oh yeah, that's what that place was like. So, so when, when people ask you why you're doing this, what do you typically tell them? I mean, the, the, it, the catalyst was my friend dying at 17. I was 17. She was 16. She died in a weird freak jet ski accident. And I had never been close to anyone who died. And I, it flicked a switch on me. It made me realize that if she could go just like that, then I could go just like that. And it really it put me in this haze. And I was searching for cheap ways to travel. You know, I, I went through this kind of philosophical renaissance after she died, where I was just searching for any sort of meaning. And I, I had watched Dead Poet Society and settled on Carpe Diem and I latched onto that. And then from there, I was searching for cheap ways to travel. You know, I'd, I was a high schooler. I didn't have any money in my bank. And <laughs> I discovered like Carl Bushby, guy walking around the world, and David Kunst, uh, an American who walked around the world in the seventies and for whatever reason, just, just stuck in my head, you know, got in there at the right time when I was looking for something. And, and then it was seven, eight years of going to school, working, paying off loans and, and saving and, and making it happen. And the journey continues. You, you, you've got, what do you think? 
two to three years left. I mean, as long as, you know, you don't get a stomach virus. <laughs> oh, God, I hope one's enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but probably two, three years. Yeah. Something around there for sure. I don't know if you can hear it, but I've had a smile on my face this whole time. I, I, I mean, this is just, I'm sure you get tired of hearing it, but this is just like a, a adventure boiled down to, to its truest form. You have such little material. Like, I mean, you have more than like a through hiker, but you're also mm-hmm. out there for years at a time rather than, you know, six months. <laughs> so you, and, and the way you're doing it, man, it's just something extremely appealing about this. That's, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it looks like. I hope this is in my future somewhere because what an adventure. For sure. I walk across America. You could do that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can do that. Yeah, man, I, I'm I'm on the bike right now. I have to get off the bike. I enjoy that. I enjoy that pace, but I think there's a lot of the similar elements to it. I do get to enjoy downhills probably a little more than you do. <laughs> yeah, oh God, yeah, downhills a nightmare for me. No, well, tell about that. I mean, is that the uphill ain't ain't any any fun either, probably. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, they're both they're both tough. When it's steep, you know, I'm pushing the carts probably ninety five hundred pounds, you know, loaded up with water and everything. And tough going up and then it's just it hurts the knees. You gotta be careful and take it easy on the way down. So wow. Yeah, it's just not it's all right. But yeah, I mean I think like you're saying, it's there's something appealing about it and you know, it was born out of me not having any money when I was younger. And so I had I had to find the simplest way to travel. You know, I'm, I was not a trust fund. I saved up for eight years nonstop. I lived at home, worked my freaking butt off, saved money. And, you know, it was just the simplest way, simplest, the, the, you know, I don't know, like, uh, just, yeah, the simplest way to travel that I could think of. So there is something definitely appealing about it, but as far as, you know, say for someone who maybe thinks about walking across, wants to walk the Americas, like this isn't, it's also not something oh, I'm just going to dip. You could dip your toes into it. Go ahead. Go for, go for a walk, go, go walk for 40 days, go walk for two months kind of thing. But it's also, it's like, it wasn't for me, it was easy for me. It was easy because this is been such a, a fundamental part of who I am. Like, this is just how I identify myself. But it's not an easy task. And I don't think, you know, for someone who thinks I would be very romantic, I don't know who the I don't know who's thinking this, but to walk, you know, the length of the Americas, there's there's been eight people who have done it, and it's only eight for a reason. There's a reason a lot of people cycle, is because you can see more cycling and you can get to hotels more often, you can find a place to sleep easier, kind of thing. And walking is it's easy, but it's freaking difficult too you're exposed a lot and and uh so i think if if for someone out there if they're thinking about this you know practical advice if you want if you're interested in something like this like walk across your country first walk across america for six months that'll be crazy walking across america for six months that would be nuts uh so i I would i would do that i would recommend that for someone if i don't know why i'm recommending things to people but I'm just saying it's, you know, this is, it's a big, big, big task for sure. Yeah. And I hope I didn't say it was easy. Uh, it, it is. No, 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 no. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah. No, I was just going off on another tangent. <laughs> oh man. I know it's simple. It's beautifully simple, but, uh, incredibly That's difficult. What I mean. That's what was, yeah. yeah my, my dad told me one time I was digging a hole. He said, I need you to dig a hole this big. He goes, it's, it's simple as hell, but backbreaking. And I was like, yeah, it's a simple idea. Dig a hole with this shovel, but you are dead at the end of the day. That's what this reminds me of. And and that's, that's why I love this show, man. You're talking to the listeners. If you want to try this out, walk across America. Like (laughs) who says that? (laughs) Oh man. So speaking of which I, I, we shared a meme on the, uh, podcast page the other day that said uh how i travel the world with just a backpack and a massive trust fund oh yeah dude i I saw that on instagram that was funny yeah (laughs) well it's like obviously none of us i mean there might be one listener out there but none of us are in that boat what how how do you do it what do you do how do you pay for this i think people are really curious about that side and it all never it doesn't always get talked about yeah sure uh well for me i try to get sponsors throughout college, I worked with this professor 
and we sent out, you know, mission statement, all this kind of stuff of my plans. But, you know, I was unproven. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't even walked like more than 10 days on the Appalachian Trail. And so uh, it ended up just being me saving money and living at home for four years. So I'd saved up a, a lot of money and uh, I thought it would be enough to get me through two years of basically paying off loans and walking at the same time. And that would get me down to Argentina. And then I hoped by then to have a, a sponsor. And so I'd saved enough. And then once I, I had saved and was ready to go, I started kind of putting things together, getting the cart ready, getting my gear ready getting the route ready, you know, really getting into the details of things. And as I was doing this, I, I had reached out to this, uh, we had, there's a maker space in the town over from me. And I went over there looking for a guy to, I had at the time, I actually had like this bike trailer that I was planning on hitching basically to my belt and walking with that. Just <laughs> I was pulling see. that. Holy cow. So I went over to see if like this guy could modify the aluminum arm and he's like, Oh dear, I'll, you know, this is amazing what you plan on doing, I'll make you, your, I'll make you a car. And he's a very gregarious guy and man about town. And he's like, once he, once we got to know each other, he's like, dude, I gotta, I gotta pump this out for you. So he will, he set up press conferences and he's contacting people and get, he ended up, you know, basically getting me sponsors and stuff. So he got me my first sponsor, which, uh, just ran my website, you know, host my website, something like that small thing, but it helps. And then, and then there's a couple articles written on me and, uh, this company, Philadelphia Sign, saw one of the articles. They had just opened up an international branch. The owner, so this is kind of like stars line thing, and this is not going to happen for everyone. But the owner, the owner knew Anne Marie, my friend who had passed away, and they had just opened up this international branch and was looking for something kind of to promote this branch. And you know, so it just worked out. And he said, "Hey, I got a text and said." I want to basically fund your entire thing. And so I said, I read the text 10 times and then, then, you know, and then we met and, you know, how much is this going to cost? And, you know, I probably could have told him any number and I told him very minimal. I mean, very, very minimal, less than minimum wage for sure. Um, You know, I'm just walking, I'm not spending a lot. And I figured if this guy is willing to pay for my dream, yeah, I'm not going to take advantage of that. I'm just going to be grateful. And so he's paying for it. And now I have a Patreon as well, which, you know, when, when he was paying for, when Philadelphia sign was sponsoring this and they still are, and they're sponsoring it, it, it was enough to get me through South America. And like, I'm living, you know, paycheck to paycheck in South America very cheaply. And, uh, and I started a Patreon when I got to Europe because Europe's more expensive and so now the Europe and now the Patreon kind of gets me through Europe, uh, you know, well enough. And so, yeah, it's kind of now it's kind of like a mixed bag of things. You know, I sell some photos here and there as well. Um, but the sponsorship was was a big part of it. And it allowed me to put all the money I had saved against my student loans. But, you know, it wouldn't have happened at the same time. You know, I, I got very lucky, but I also had this idea in my head for eight years and then saved for four years to give myself the opportunity to roll the dice and hope for a sponsor. And the sponsor just worked out before, you know, I thought it was going to happen maybe by Argentina, but it happened before I even took a step. I want to take a second to tell you about The Nomadic. It's a subscription box curated for outdoor enthusiasts by outdoor enthusiasts. So each month you get a handpicked selection of the latest and greatest outdoor gear that's been trip tested and approved by the Nomadic product team, which is made up of guides, athletes, and you know, bona fide adventurers. They partner with brands like Mountain Smith, Gear Aid, Sea Line, Mizu, Empowered, RX Bar, and a lot more. This month's theme is Relax to the Max. So one item inside is an exclusive hammock by Lawson Hammocks, an award-winning hammock maker who's been voted number one by Backpacker and Outside Magazine. So order by May 14th to get this box. So get quality gear by Brands You Trust delivered right to your doorstep monthly. Learn more at thenomadic.com slash ASP. This episode is also sponsored by CS Instant Coffee, 100% Arabica coffee with compostable packaging. And you can find them at csinstant.coffee.com. 
and use adventure at checkout for 20% off. That is encouraging. And I, I know, like you said, it's not going to happen for everybody, but for the people I know who have taken a, a journey like this and, and, and started, the stars do seem to align much more frequently than the people who haven't started. And yeah. the fact that you didn't have every duck in a row before you left for something so freaking huge is awesome because say you got halfway through the Americas and had to stop due to finances, you still hiked halfway through the Americas. You still had this pretty much a year of experiences. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. And if you would have had to quit at that point, that's still life changing as can be, but things just align. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I was very, very fortunate, but you know, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing where you gotta, you gotta give yourself a chance on these things. And I think when you dismiss something before, yeah, uh, just knowing I'm, I'm not going to get a sponsor or whatever, maybe you, maybe you won't get a sponsor. Maybe, maybe you go through your whole thing and you spend your money. But the thing is you have to be willing, is this, are you going to do it for the money? Obviously people who are cycling or doing these things, are not doing it for the money. They're doing it and they're living in the tent and they're either eating top ramen or, you know, rice and beans for a dollar in Guatemala, whatever. And, but you have to, you have to be willing to do that first. And, and that's the first thing is that you can't just go searching for a sponsor and say, Hey, like I want to live this luxurious lifestyle, you know, cycling or, you know, touring around the world doing this thing is, you know, if you want to do that, try and find that, try and find your sponsor. But if you just want to travel, go travel and then try and make a sponsor happen. I absolutely agree, man. You you put yourself out there, be willing to go through, be willing to be frugal, be willing to be a little hardcore sometimes. And, and man, things it's amazing what seems to work out in, through, through connections you never saw, you could never yeah. foresee, absolutely never foresee. And I'm, I'm sure that's just been a recurring theme on your trip. One part, another part people like to hear is how's your gear changed? I know you were pushing a cart and uh, you were carrying, I think you mentioned like 50, 60 pounds before. Is, is is anything real major change with that or is it kind of the same deal? No, same deal. I mean, uh, I same general idea. You know, I've swapped some things out here and there. I like, for example, I had solar panels at the beginning and a little solar battery thing. Swap that out for just regular little power pack i found that more efficient um i would say the biggest swap for me has been just refining my tent and figuring out exactly what i need in a tent I think that's the biggest thing I'm, I'm using this uh tarp tent right now and when i was uh when i was at home sick i was searching i had i'd been through i guess only three tents at that point but they're very they're all very different and I was trying out different things and I, I, I was searching the internet deep in the internet, just trying to find this perfect tent that fit everything, you know, that is freestanding, but isn't too big, isn't too light. Um, I mean, I was, it's, it's tough enough and, you know, I have Savannah, my dog, I didn't want it to be a one man. I wanted her to be able to come in when it's raining or something like that. And so I didn't want to be a two man with a huge footprint. So kind of, Basically, it's just I just refine that. So that's what I'm most satisfied with is the the biggest gear change is just honing honing the the perfect tent for this for this type of travel. And did did you find it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, yeah, the tarp tent. The tarp tent is this thing. Uh, this thing's a dream. Yeah, it it fits. It's everything perfectly. I'm um, right now. Uh, for example, I I was I had a I had a hyper light tent. I spent like. Nine hundred dollars on the tent. I was going to be sleeping in this thing every night. Get this purely waterproof tent, and uh, it was this pyramid or mid two man mid. The footprint was huge though, and it was white and it really stood out. And it was also not freestanding. And then so after that, just got destroyed through the Americas. I went to a one man, and then not like I was in Argentina calling this monsters downpour and i had i i brought savannah in and she was like laying on top of my chest like this isn't gonna work i can't bring any of my stuff (laughs) i can't write or anything in here and so i needed you know i just just honing so right now i have this tarp tent i'm sitting right next to it and 
I have it uh, freestanding and it's a small thing, but when you're on the road, you know, 365 out of 365, you need to have that optionality of it freestanding just, just gives you more options. And it's a little, it's green, so it's a little bit stealthier. I can hide away a little better. It's, it's very adjustable. It's a good size, not too big. I can sit up in it. It's just, yeah, I got it, got it down, got the perfect tent. I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. If you're, if you're willing to live in it every single day of the year, that's must be a good yeah. one. H- how is Savannah doing? Savannah's good, man. She's uh she's a beast. I mean, she's, you know, we'll walk like in Algeria, walk 30 miles all day, non-problem. And then like, we'll get back and I'll be dead exhausted and she's still like poking me to play she'll like come over with a stick she's oh she's goodness. just she's good she's uh she's about four now and uh yeah man she's beast I, I look at my dog sometimes and think you add so much to my life you don't even know do, is, do you feel the same way about savannah oh for sure man yeah i mean but like what greater bonds uh, and i'm walking with this dog every single day we spend almost every minute of every day together you know she's going for an eight six hour walk every day <laughs> so she's happy she's fit so you're walking uh, your dog for a living <laughs> yeah I'm walking my dog for a living and you know it's just i mean i like i remember when i first got her in in texas and she was just this little puppy and i knew i was looking when i went to adopt dogs i knew i wanted a dog from I was camping in, in the U S and I was just waking up in the middle of the night in the woods and thinking I heard something. I'd be sitting there, you know, pumped with adrenaline for 10 minutes thinking I heard something, then I'd fall back asleep and then I'd wake up again. And I just kept thinking, man, it'd be really nice to have a dog with me. And so when I got to Texas and my cousins in Austin, I went to an, a, a shelter and I was looking at all these adults and just none of them really fit, but I was looking for an adult because, okay, they're going to be, you know, be ready to walk right away. It'll be good. But they ended up bringing out Savannah and her sister. They're just little puppies. They found them on the street and I saw her and I was like, bam, that's my girl. So I got her and it ended up being a great decision. It was really difficult at first because she was a puppy. She wasn't walking. I would put her in the back basket of my cart. She would just hang out. I get her to walk like 10 minutes, put her back in the back basket and then day by day, okay, she's walking 20 minutes, then an hour. And then by Mexico, she was walking all day and, you know, and already building that muscle. And, and it, it but at, at the beginning, when I had her, even through Mexico and stuff, I didn't even, I didn't feel any affection towards her. And I don't know how, it was probably the same thing with your dog. I imagine with most people where it's like, you like it, it's a cute dog. And, you know, I like dogs, but you didn't have any, I don't have any connection i didn't really feel anything and then i remember sometime like in in south mexico or maybe in guatemala like i remember like coming back to her and i was like oh man i love this little bugger and <laughs> you know now that it's that time is a million you know we've, we've been through so much and it's like she's with me all the time you know if, like i have like this weird fantasy of like of like some girl He's like, it's me or your dog. I'd be like, like Savannah every day of the week. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm like, she's so loyal to me and it's built the same loyalty. I feel like this fierce loyalty to her where, and it, it really built also from the hotels too, where like in the Americas, you know, the, the dogs are, unless you're in Bogota or in Lima, you're in a city. The dogs are probably there just to, they're probably outside protecting this person's house and they, the people feed them outside. And so they're, they're like outside dogs and they're, they're not like, they're not a part of the family and they're definitely not going into the hotels. So all through the Americas, you know, every hotel I'd go to, I, I would be convincing these people to, you know, she's a good dog. She's vaccinated. She's well trained, but it, it ends up just being me defending her, trying to get her in every night. Like she's my dog. And I'll, and but it, it it gets to the point where look like if if you're not gonna give me the room, we're not staying here. And it's like I don't like, oh well, we have a you can put her on the roof. And no, like she's coming in the room. She just walked all day with me. She's walked all these across the desert with me. She's coming in the room with me too. She's gonna get as good good a sleep as I am, kind of thing. And so that kind of built this like almost defensive it's probably the same with 
children and with other people and their dogs, but become really def- defensive and fierce in, in my loyalty for her where hey, like she's getting, you know, she's staying here with me and then that's it. If you're not, then we're walking and we'll go sleep on the street, but we're going to be together and you know, I'm not leaving her behind. That is beautiful. Unbelievably beautiful. What, so let me ask you this. What, did, so she's a good walker. She stays with you. Cause I honestly don't think my dogs would stay with me just because they're so used to doing what they want to do. Yeah. I think they'd run out in the street or something. Yeah. So I mean, Savannah's like, I think your your dogs would definitely adjust. I mean, after such mm. a long time. Yeah, and I, and I figured since she started out doing that, you've you've been able to hone her skills and yeah, train her for sure. I mean, she's this is like her life. You know, she, I got her when she was three months old, and this is what she's done. You know, besides those seven months when I was sick or eight months when I was sick, she's done this almost every day of her life, and so she this is like what she knows best, and she's really. You know, she's, she's as much a professional as I am and she'll get to a road. This is a perfect example. So uh, we're in Argentina and we stop at this gas station. This is really, it was kind of bizarre. So we stopped at this gas station and this guy there, I'm like resting, talking to this guy. And he says, Hey, like for the, 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 the next part of this road, it's like this dirt road. Next part of this road, there's like some packs of dogs up ahead. So like carry the stick with you. And I was like, all right, yeah, thanks, man. I, I grabbed the stick. And then I just like sat it aside because I had dealt with dogs. You know, I'd never come across a, a pack of dogs. I dealt with dogs here and there kind of thing. And I've been able to fend them all off. And, you know, it's just something to deal with. And we're walking and, you know, an hour passes or whatever. And then like out of nowhere and Savannah's off leash because usually show like if a dog, you know, if a dog comes up, even if she's off leash, just like rabid dog comes up not rabid but you know this territorial dog comes up she'll like spin around and kind of tail goes between the legs and she'll sit down like maybe the ear pin back or maybe she'll like run up ahead around the cart kind of thing but she won't take off and you know she'll let me kind of like you know fend off this dog or whatever and but this pack of dogs comes out like 10 dogs out of oh nowhere, like up this little hill. They just come out of freaking nowhere. I've never seen anything like this. And they go after Savannah and Savannah just bolts. And I'm, I, I bolt, I start running after her. I'm with the running with the cart, but they're gone. Well head. And up to the right is this big highway. And I hear them barking and they're all chasing after her. and get out of view. And I see them go up towards the highway. I'm like, Oh my God, like something happens to her. And I'm sprinting. I'm yelling for her. I'm sprinting after her and finally I catch up. And I see her, seed it her ears like you know she's terrified ears pinned back and uh, and but right on the white line of like the highway and she knows like she's smart enough not crossing that line and you know for she's afraid of the dogs but she knew not to go cross like that line without me and so she's sitting there right on the edge of the road and the dogs were just smelling her and you know it was fine their tails were wagging but you know scared the hell out of her and uh yeah, so she she knows, she knows, she's a smart dog, she's a smart dog. Oh, what a panic, you know. It's yeah. there's there's yeah. there's it's a pure love, man, for a dog. I I if if you're not a dog person out there, I, I feel for you cuz it is yeah. man, there is something to it. There's something about it. It is awesome. And the fact really? that you're having <laughs> this whole life with your dog is just unbelievable. It's it's I don't know. I'm sure you hear it all the time. It's a movie in the making. It's Pure, pure, yeah, one of the purest adventures I've ever heard of. It's great, man. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, she's living a good life. I'm living a good life and, uh, you know, very grateful. Do you, do you have any story that sticks out to you in the last leg of the trip? What just that you'd like to share? I, I mean, I hate, I hate, I know we've kind of gone over the time we usually do, but man, I, I don't, I know you don't have interviews like this every day, you know? Uh, yeah it's fine yeah fine with me man i mean i'll just keep talking that's you know just hanging out by the tent yeah let me think uh let's see I'm trying to think in algeria or i mean algeria had the police escort with me which kind of which really sterilized things it really took you know just because they, they're like if i had someone come up to me that there, there would be three policemen like up there interrogating this guy who wanted to talk to me so it took a lot of <laughs> It took a lot of the uh, a lot of the adventure out of it in a, in a certain way, man. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't know what kind of what kind of stuff do you want. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. know. Yeah, I mean, 
you've honestly told so many stories. I just remember Kurt asking right at the end, and I was like, oh, I got to do that too. That was a really good move, Kurt. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. But if nothing sticks out, don't worry, man. You've told like dozens already, and it's all bleeding together right now. Sorry. Well, no, what, so what are you, what are you looking forward to the most up ahead? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm weirdly, I'm really looking, it's a long way away, but I'm really looking forward to Mongolia. That's what I thought you were going to say that. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, like I, I was looking forward to Italy and Italy's great and I'm, I'm just soaking it up right now. And Italy's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in something right now that I was looking forward to. So I'm appreciating that. And Croatia is the same way where I, I have a lot of family there and, you know, but Europe is Europe is a totally different beast. It's so, you know, so developed and so familiar culturally that it's very comfortable. And I'm really enjoying that. But I think Mongolia is going to bring me back to that and Kazakhstan. It'll be Kazakhstan and Mongolia. And I think both of those, I'm looking forward to kind of going back to Peru and Chile and, you know, Ecuador and Colombia, going back to that little more wild side of walking. And it's still a long way away. And I'm going to enjoy everything and enjoy walking through Greece and Turkey and Azerbaijan and enjoy all that. And it'll be all different things. But right now, what's sticking out in my head is, man, walking those steps in Mongolia seems pretty epic. You got a hell of a long way to go until you get there. So <laughs> it's a long way off, a long way off for sure. Wow. So, so where do you envision the trip being over? Because I, I, I tried to click on the map, but you have to be a patron. So I, I just figured I'd ask. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the the Patreon map is actually that's not even the full map. Uh, that's just uh, live tracking. So I carry oh, a GPS. Oh, interesting. Yeah, but it'll end up. It'll end where I started. So what the route from here is basically me going up Italy and then down uh, towards like Croatia, Greece, uh, Istanbul, you know, across Turkey up to Azerbaijan. I'll take a boat across the Caspian towards Kazakhstan. Walk across Mongolia. And then I'll fly down to Australia, walk across Australia, and then walk back across the U.S. Uh, back home. Uh, so yeah, that's that's it. So awesome. Do you do you have any idea what life will be like after this? No, man. I mean, you know, it's what what I'm really fortunate in the sense that, and this is one of the reasons also why I wanted to walk is because when you cycle or when you do a road trip. It ends up being a, a couple months at a time or maybe two years, even two years of a really long cycle trip, which people do. Mm -hmm. But I wanted it to be long. I wanted this to be my life kind of thing. So by doing this and by it being five, six years with me getting sick, with it being five years, it enables me to kind of build some skills. It enables me to become a better writer, better photographer. So I'm just hoping by the time this is done, I have some skills developed and uh where you know i can hopefully work independently i mean that's just that's the main goal you know i don't know what it's going to be but i just want to work independently hopefully grow and become independently wealthy uh but i think it would be very difficult to go back to uh, uh to be working underneath someone else after you know this lifestyle is just like the ultimate freedom i can sit with a coffee for as long as i want I can lay in my tent if I want. I can walk as long as I want. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a very nice lifestyle. And ob for obvious reasons, I would like to continue that. So the goal is just develop some skills and, and uh, hopefully be able to turn that into, uh, you know, me working for myself. I, I, well, the good news is the end won't, won't sneak up on you very fast. <laughs> so you'll have, <laughs> you'll yeah, have plenty of time to... And honestly, if this trip's taught you anything, probably going to be something you don't even imagine exists right now, but just yeah. one thing leads to another. And, and I know one thing, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to talk about this for the rest of your life and who knows what it's going to lead to, what other adventures, what other career paths. I mean, I'm excited for you just because it's, no, your life will never, never be the same. I don't think you have anything to worry about in the sense of what you're going to do when you get back home. It's. It's gonna be epic. I'd say that Marcus, my 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 favorite book. That it's it's sort of my Bible. It's the book I always refer to, is uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, and he has this uh, aphorism in there which says essentially, like, why don't worry about any problems in the future because you're gonna face them with the same um, 
what is it, the same powers that you have today. And so basically is, do you trust, do you trust yourself? Do you trust your abilities today? If you do, you'll be fine in the future kind of thing. And that's for something like this, like walking where you, you have to trust yourself. You have to trust your ability to figure out, and you know, the same thing with cycling, you you've done this, you have to be able to trust your ability to, to travel on your own and to get yourself out of situations and to, to make the right judgment call. And uh, I think this is a great thing about traveling solo is that you develop that ability to trust yourself and to learn about yourself. And, and it's something, you know, I have, I'm not worried about the future for sure. You know, I, I trust myself and uh, I'm happy now. So I'm sure I'll be happy tomorrow. Words of wisdom right there. H- how are you doing? How you feel? Oh, I'm good, man. I'm good. Yeah. Nah, I'm great. Yeah. You know, it's life is good. Life is good. Yeah. I'm just looking forward to, uh, got some, I, I got some nice photos today. So I'm looking forward to editing those. I got some pasta I'm going to cook up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm good, man. Life is living the dream. I can't wait to follow you now a little more closely because I was just a fan before. Now I've, after talking to you, there's obviously a different element to it. So, well, man, I don't want to keep you. I know you're probably starving, so I'm going to let you get to dinner. <laughs> Enjoy your evening hey. with Savannah. And uh, thanks thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. Appreciate uh, you letting me ramble on and on. And uh, Yeah, shoot me, uh, shoot me a message when uh, the, the show comes out. I'm going to see how see how it turns out cool and uh could you just share how, how can people help you and in, in, in follow you yeah uh, it's the world walk basically across everything uh you know instagram facebook.com patreon the world walk i send out postcards and i send out touch notes uh every month uh, i put up full resolution photos there for people i do monthly q a's you can live track uh, and then on my blog, I have stories roughly weekly that go a little bit deeper in. Uh, and I have a YouTube now, which I'm working on, which that's yeah, you know, starting off of that. But yeah, the world walk across everything. Perfect. All right. And we will link all that and encourage people to support you on Patreon. I know how important that is. That'd be great, man. Appreciate it. Man, Tom, have a good night, man. And enjoy, enjoy your day. Enjoy tomorrow and have a good walk. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Talk to you later. Good talking to you. All right, see ya. Well, first of all, thank you so much for listening to this episode. It really means the world to us that you want to spend your time with us. If you'd like to help us further, please just leave us a review on iTunes, share us on social media, tell your friends about us. You can become a patron, a supporter of the show for $5 a month at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. And if you know somebody that would make a good guest, reach out. We're always looking for good adventure and outdoor stories. And lastly, thank you to our sponsors whose messages follow right now. Athletic Brewing makes the best non-alcoholic craft beer. Go to their website at athleticbrewing.com and use the code in our show notes to save 15% on your first order. The Nomadic, the first outdoor subscription box that helps you go on more adventures with the latest gear by delivering themed monthly boxes with innovative products and an outdoor challenge to match. Learn more at thenomadic.com slash adventure sports podcast. After all this adventure talk, if you're needing some gear yourself, but you need some advice before buying, go to backpacktribe.com where you can ask questions to the owners who have experience with all the gear as well as all of it for sale right there on their website.